Hi everybody, this is Peter Schiff. It is Friday, November 5th, 2014. As most of you probably know by now, I ended my daily radio show, The Peter Schiff Show, last week. Friday before the Labor Day weekend was the final episode of the daily Peter Schiff Show. I want to make sure everybody knows that going forward, the show is going to be replaced with a weekly podcast. It's still going to be The Peter Schiff Show, but I'm going to deliver it in a podcast form rather than in a daily radio show. The podcast should be about two hours in length, and it will be done again weekly. The plan is to break the podcast up into segments. So if people don't want to listen to the entire two hours, although some of you uh, probably will want to listen to the entire podcast, maybe not all in one sitting, but maybe you will. But we'll break it up into shorter segments where you'll be able to skip the topics that you may not be interested in listening to. I'm not going to have the guests, although maybe once in a while I'll interview somebody for the podcast, but it's not going to be a routine occurrence the way I did it on my radio show. Now, when I did the radio show, We had premium members, people who subscribed, and they were able to listen without the commercials, and they could go back in the archives and listen whenever they wanted to. And the reason we had the premium members is because it cost me quite a bit of money to produce the radio show, and so I was trying to offset some of the production costs with premium subscriptions. But now that we're doing the podcast model, we don't have those production costs, so we are making the podcast available to everybody for free, And so anybody can listen to any of the podcasts. They'll be archived. You can listen to the most recent one. You can go back in time and listen to the ones from prior weeks. The important thing for me is dissemination. I want to make sure that as many people as possible are able to take advantage of the information that I'll be putting out on a weekly basis in my podcast. So try to help spread the word. Try to get as many people as you can Uh, to listen to the podcast. Now, you'll be able to listen to it on this YouTube channel. We're going to take some of the segments, break them down, and load them up as YouTube videos. But if you just want to get the whole podcast, the same website, shiftradio.com, will host the Peter Schiff podcast. Also, iTunes or any place else on the internet where you're used to uploading podcasts, you'll be able to find uh, the weekly Peter Schiff podcast. So basically, I want to make sure that I get that information out today on my YouTube channel so the people who uh, routinely watch these videos will know that I do have the podcast now to replace the daily Peter Schiff show. And hopefully, the podcast will end up reaching even more people based on the format that we are using. Now, one thing the podcast isn't going to have is video. And we had video for the radio show. The reason the podcast is not going to have video is we want to make it easier to produce a higher quality audio podcast uh, that might be more accessible, uh, you know, more entertaining than if we had to throw video into the mix. Uh, So those of you who enjoy watching me, although I don't know that I'm that, you know, you know, stimulating to look at, uh, but You'll still be able to see my video blogs that I will be recording, hopefully with a little bit more frequency, uh, now that I am not doing the daily radio show. Which really brings me into uh, the the discussion that I want to have on today's video blog. But it's going to be a bit abbreviated, because I'm going to address these issues in much greater detail in this week's podcast, which should be available Uh, This weekend, Monday at the latest, but maybe over the weekend. So watch uh, the YouTube channel. But, you know, make sure you like my Facebook page or follow me on Twitter because as soon as that podcast is posted and ready to go, we will, you know, send it out uh, on all the social media channels that I have. So it's always good to just be signed up everywhere that I have something. And that way you'll be among the first to listen to the new podcast. And I'm going to get into many different topics, not just the two that I want to address briefly here today. But number one, let's talk about the jobs numbers that came out earlier today. And this was going to be a big jobs report. The lowest estimate on Wall Street 
was 190,000. That was the lowest anybody went. The highest, I think, some guy was at 310,000 jobs for August. The consensus was about, I think, 230,000 jobs. We actually created 142,000 jobs. That's it. That is the lowest job creation of the year. And of course, everybody is surprised. In fact, most people don't even believe it. I was listening to Diane Swank and I was listening to Mark Zandi. They said, oh, this is, they, we don't, they're not going to believe this. Diane Swank said she'd believe this report when pigs fly. So they all just assume that any bad number is an aberration because they're all convinced that this recovery exists when it exists only in the minds of the people who want to perceive it. You know, they, you know they're all saying beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Well, so is a recovery. Because there really is no recovery, although lots of people are choosing to believe that there is one. Uh, but it is very uh, subjective because it's more wishful thinking. Because the data really doesn't support the idea that there is an economic recovery. Look, even something as trivial as box office. Right? I read that the summer box office this year was about the worst in 20 years. If we finally have this full-fledged recovery... Why can't Americans afford a movie ticket? You know, I mean, now some people are trying to say, well, you know, the movies are bad this year. No, they're not. International box office is up. So what, the foreigners like the movies, but the Americans don't? I mean, plus, you know, Americans don't have that great taste in theater anyway. They'll see anything. It's, the, it's more of the experience. A lot of going to the movies is just the night out. It's a date. It's a way to hang out with your friends, right? Get out of the house. Get out. People go to the movies. The thing that's holding people back is they can't afford the price. That's the problem. And it's because the economy is a disaster. And, you know, nobody on Wall Street wants to acknowledge that. That's why, you know, they're going to write this thing off as a one-off event. And now we have to wait until September and get another bad jobs report, which is probably coming, for, to get more people to be convinced that, in fact, uh, the much talked about, highly anticipated recovery is not here. In fact, labor force participation went down back to 62.8. That ties the record low since 1978. We have a new record as far as the number of Americans not in the labor force. And of course, the problem is, again, when we report the jobs, it's a net number, right? Because beneath the surface, you have full-time jobs being destroyed and part-time jobs being added. And of course, a lot of these part-time jobs are from people who would prefer not to be working at all because most of the new jobs or the only age demographic that is gaining jobs are the, the older people, people in their 60s and 70s. They're getting jobs. Why? Because they can't afford to stay retired. So they got to take one of these crappy part-time jobs and because uh, that's all they can do to make ends meet. You know, I was watching the labor secretary uh, uh, interviewed by Steve Leisman, you know, the blind interviewing the blind. And he was still, you know, you know, trying to put the best administrative spin on these numbers by saying things are still good. But what was his he said, well, what we need is to put money in the pockets of Americans. He said that consumption. Right. He said consumption is missing from the recovery. Well, what do you mean it's missing? GDP is still 70 percent consumption. The problem is there's too much consumption. What's missing is savings and investment and production. He says we need to put money in the pockets of Americans. No, what we need is Americans producing, not more inflation. He advocated a hike in the minimum wage as if that's going to put more money in people's pockets. It's not more money. It's more production. We need to put purchasing power in people's pockets. You know, ironically, Steve Leisman asked um, the, the labor secretary, if he was worried about the Europeans or the Japanese debasing their currencies, which is a ridiculous question because they should be worried about that, not us. But of course, that's an example of the Europeans putting purchasing power into the pockets of Americans. Because when the Europeans devalue the euro, that means Americans now can buy more and Europeans can buy less. That means European purchasing power is being transferred from Americans, I mean, from Europeans to Americans. But look, I, I've got a lot more to say on the jobs numbers and, of course, the market reaction to the job numbers. But I'm going to save that for 
this week's uh, video blog because I don't want to you know steal all of my own thunder and I want to give everybody a reason uh, to listen to it. So I've got a lot more to say, but now that I started talking about Europe, let me touch on the other big news story. And I think even a bigger story was yesterday's surprise rate cut coming from the ECB, right? They cut rates from 0.15 to 0.00105, right? It was a 10 basis point cut as if that's going to make a difference. They lowered the deposit rate from point or negative point 0.1 to negative point 0.2. Aha, this is, this is going to work, right? I mean, for anybody, any economist or banker to survey the economic landscape in Europe and come to the conclusion that the problem is interest rates are just too high. That's the problem. The rates are all the way up at 0.15. We just need to lower them to 0.005. I mean, you're talking about rates right now in some European countries are at the lowest they've been in 300 years. Well, if they're at the lowest they've been in hundreds of years, how can you argue that they're too high? Why would anybody think that lowering them just a teeny bit more, yeah, that's the ticket. That's going to do the trick. All these other rate cuts failed, but this next cut from 0.15 to 0.005, that's the one that's finally going to work. Right. Talk about the the idea of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. They've already slashed rates in Europe. If lower rates were the answer, it would have already worked. The reason that they're still in an economic malaise, the reason they still don't have the GDP growth, the reason they still have so much unemployment has nothing to do with rates being too high. Of course, Europe is also arguing that inflation is too low, right? Because inflation in the Eurozone is, the way the government measures it, which of course is not even accurate over there either, the way they measure it, it's like 0.4%. And they're saying if it was only higher, if it was only 2% instead of 0.4%, then we would have all this economic growth. Of course, that's all nonsense. In fact, you know, I read this article about, and they, they called it shrinkflation. You know, like shrinkage from, from Seinfeld, only what shrinkflation had to do with was when companies, instead of raising prices, they just shrink their product. And they're saying that that's one of the reasons we're not having inflation is because we're getting shrinkflation instead. But the article basically warned that, look, there's only so small you can make a package, and this could be a precursor to actual inflation. Now, the reality is, Shrinking packaging is the same thing as raising prices. It's all inflation, or it's all the result of inflation, which is the expansion of the money supply. The fact that manufacturers choose to pass on those price increases in the form of shrinking their product sizes doesn't mean their consumer isn't paying a higher price. Right? Think about it this way. You know, if, if I manufacture toilet paper, And I decide instead of raising my price by 10%, I'm just going to put 10% fewer sheets in each roll, right? And now I sell you a roll that's 10% smaller. Yeah, you pay the same price. But over the course of a year, assuming, you know, your habits don't change, you're going to have to buy 10% more rolls than you did the prior year to have the same amount of paper, which means you're paying 10% more for your toilet paper. So it's the same difference. Right? It's still inflation. It's still manifesting itself in higher prices. So this is going on in, in Europe too. But the central bankers are basically betting the farm. They're going all in on inflation. They're saying if we can just create more inflation, we're going to get the growth and the employment gains. What if they're wrong? What if it doesn't work? What if they get 2% inflation as measured by their own you know, phony statistics. What if they get 2% or 25 or 3% and it doesn't help? What if it doesn't create economic growth? What if it doesn't create jobs? What if it actually does the opposite? What if it stifles economic growth because it undermines standards of living? It makes consumer goods more expensive and therefore it destroys demand, which is true. They, they want to create demand by creating inflation. You don't create demand, you destroy demand. Demand goes up when prices go down. Demand goes down when prices go up. That is the law of supply and demand. Now, they think they can get around this law. I guess governments are so used to breaking laws 
especially the ones that they write, they think that they can break this law too. But they can no more break the law of supply and demand than they can defy the laws of gravity. So the point is, what is going to happen when it doesn't work, right? They bet the farm on inflation. Europe bets on it. Japan bets on it. America bets on it. And, we don't, and then we get inflation, but we don't get growth. And now we've got 3%, 4% official inflation. Then what are they going to do? Are they going to jack up interest rates? Because they're afraid to jack them up now, even to 1%. How are they going to jack them up to 5 or 6%? And you know, whatever damage they thought higher rates was going to cause to the economy, well, it's going to cause it in spades when they have to jack it up high enough to fight the inflationary fire that they deliberately lit. And of course, if they don't fight that fire because they're too afraid of it, then it's going to burn all these economies to a cinder because we're going to have this currency crisis. Now, of course, when the Europeans announced this surprise cut and they you know, talked about QE2, you know, their own QE, expanding their balance sheet, maybe a trillion dollars worth or so, we had a big drop in the euro. Uh, about may lost maybe about two percent of its value went down below 130 for the first time all year. Remember the euro got up to about 140 uh, before the European Central Bankers came out and basically you know committed uh, monetary Harry Carry. They killed their own currency by talking it down because they were afraid of putting purchasing power in the pockets of their citizens. They were afraid that their citizens might not have to suffer a increase in the cost of living, so they deliberately undermined. Uh, their own currency, but the euro went below uh, 130. And a lot of that had to do with this false belief that, well, Europe is easing, the Fed is going to be tightening. The Fed is going to be ending QE and raising interest rates. Well, the horrible jobs report that came out today should already be putting, you know, dampening that fire. Now, so many people are dismissing it, they might have to wait for more bad jobs numbers. Well, I guess the good news or the bad news is they're not going to have to wait much longer because we're going to get jobs numbers every month. And I think they're going to continue to be bad. And ultimately, the Federal Reserve is going to do the same thing the ECB is doing. They're going to be looking at a renewed recession and they're going to come back with more of the same failed medicine. They're going to be launching an even bigger round of QE than what is currently being contemplated by the Europeans. And so it's not going to be the euro that's going to be getting beaten up. It's going to be the dollar. But of course, all currencies are going to get beaten up relative to gold. And again, I'm going to have a lot more to say about the reaction to the ECB, to the jobs numbers, the reaction in the stock markets, in the precious metals markets, in the forex markets, plus several other uh, things that came out during the week uh, that caught my interest. Remember, when I did my daily radio show, uh, I had to come up with things to talk about every day. Now what I'm doing on my podcast is just the most interesting stuff of the week. That's what I'm going to talk about. So the two hours that I'm going to pack into this podcast should be a lot more compelling and a lot more interesting and to the point than the, what, I, what, I, what I covered on the daily radio show. And again, you'll be able to easily skip through the parts that you're not interested in and focus only on what you're interested in. And of course, if you're interested in everything I have to say, well, you'll have two hours of material to listen to. Again, it's going to be the Peter Schiff podcast. Check it out, shiftradio.com. Same website, uh, just different format. Oh, and by the way, I almost forgot, we still have some copies of my dad's comic book or short fable on inflation, The Kingdom of Malts. Uh, we sold a lot of copies as a going away kind of souvenir memento of the Peter Schiff show. I still have some more signed copies available. So if you didn't get yours, and of course, if you ordered yours, I appreciate your patience. Almost all of them, in fact, all of them, I think by now have in fact been shipped out. So if you don't have your copy, it is in the mail and you will be getting it. But if you haven't ordered your copy yet, we still have some more. And all you need to do to order your own copy while supplies last of the Kingdom of Malts is go to shiftbooks.com and order. You can order one copy, two copies, as many as you like. As long as we have copies, uh, we will be shipping out. They're great to read for yourself, but even better to give to a friend. Give this somebody to help explain to them exactly what inflation is and where it comes from. Because there is so much confusion on this subject right now that it's important that we find a way to educate people. And usually humor and simplicity and maybe illustrations, unfortunately, is the best way to educate so many people 
uh, not only in America, but probably around the world. Again, bye for now, and I'll be talking to you soon on the Peter Schiff Podcast.